Let us begin with the check the technology. It seems to work. So now we come to one of the core topics of the semester. As you have realized, we have really worked for many weeks towards this point. Uh, namely, now we will start discussing spin one. Spin one, we will begin with a massive case, which leads to the so-called Broca field. And uh, afterwards, we will discuss the massless case. And uh, we have already done a lot of preparatory work. At the beginning of the semester, we introduced the notion of constraints, the theory of constraints in the Grangian and Hamiltonian systems, where we already saw the appearance of gauge invariants, unphysical fields, unphysical degrees of freedom, which can be eliminated, and so on, which is what we will need here. Um, Later on, we have discussed the Poincaré representations and the Lorentz group representations where we also saw an interesting mismatch, which was particularly prominent for spin one fields, uh, where we already had the imagination that that could be related to gauge invariance when we have to quantize the theory. And now uh, we will actually uh, study all of this in detail and we will see how it all fits together and how we will need these concepts in order to deal with spin one fields. The massive case is easier, that is why we start with it uh, in detail and afterwards we will come to the massless case which um, contains, for example, the photon. First, we come back to our general logic as I stressed a few times in principle, we could make a list of all possible Lorentz invariant field theories because we have classified all Lorentz covariant fields by their representations of the Lorentz group. And there is a complete classification of the finite dimensional <coughs> Lorentz group representations, which are denoted like this with two indices, J1, J2, where both can take integer or half integer values. So the simplest was the 0, 0, the scalar representation, the next 1 half comma 0 or 0 comma 1 half, which is the spin 1 half representation. And so the next would be the 1 half comma 1 half representation, which is actually the four vector representation, but uh, that is um, what we need to show. Anyway, in the general scheme of things, uh, this would be the next step and then there would be infinitely many more steps that one could study if one would want to. So let us discuss this representation and the simple statement which I already made is that this one half representation is equivalent to the four vector representation. So it sounds unintuitive at first sight because you see here spin one half appearing, but the spin one half is combined in a way such that we get the four vector representation. And the very simple reason, and the very basic uh, observation that you can make in order to understand this is to note that we already uh, made the statement that such an object with two spinors, psi1 and psi2, if you combine them in this way, psi1 bar gamma mu psi2, you get a four vector. That is a four vector, and that shows you that there is a connection between a product of two spin one half objects and a four vector, and the translation, um, translational device are the gamma mu matrices. And so let us just make this a little bit more explicit, but uh, that is the basic point. And so let me give you a few details. So for every real uh, four vector V mu, we can do the following. We can define a Hermitian complex two by two matrix <laughs> namely we can define it as and I will call this matrix V tilde that is a two by two Hermitian matrix 
is defined as V0 times the unit matrix in two dimensions plus the sum over the VI times the Pauli matrices, which are also Hermitian two by two matrices. So the unit matrix and the three Pauli matrices, they form a basis uh, of the four linearly independent Hermitian two by two matrices. And so in this way, we obtain, uh, since the Vs are real, um, an arbitrary Hermitian complex two by two matrix from a four vector. And that is actually equivalent. Uh, so from every four vector, you can define such a Hermitian two by two matrix, but you can also go back If you have such a V tilde, then you can do one half of the trace of uh, V tilde times the unit matrix. That gives then V zero. Why? Because if you take the trace of V tilde, you have the trace of the unit matrix times V zero, that gives two times V zero, and the trace of all the gamma matrices vanishes. Therefore, they do not contribute in the trace. So this trace gives you V0 and one half of the trace of this V tilde times a Pauli matrix. That gives then the appropriate component VI because um, if you now evaluate the trace, then you have here products, unit matrix times Pauli matrix gives trace zero some other Pauli matrix times that Pauli matrix, that gives trace zero, but the same Pauli matrix times this Pauli matrix, the square is the unit matrix, gives trace two. Therefore, uh, you can go in both directions from a four vector, you get a Hermitian two by two matrix, and from a Hermitian two by two matrix, you can reconstruct a four vector. Now, let us look at the Lorentz transformations and let us uh, specifically look at the while representation of the gamma matrices. Then we have here gamma mu times uh, V mu or V slash, that uh, four by four matrix that has this structure, namely here in the upper block component, there is this V tilde, here there is something else, and here there is zero. Because the gamma matrices in the while representation mm, actually, uh, let's do it in the opposite way. So let us uh, do it here with the lower component. Sorry about that. Let me change this. Lower component VI. And uh, then, of course, we get here the lower component that doesn't change the picture. So let us define the V tilde in that way with the lower index. And then uh, here we also have the same thing. So here in the upper component of the gamma matrices in the while representation, there is exactly for gamma zero the unit matrix and for the spatial components there are the Pauli matrices. Therefore, in this uh, V slash combination, at this corner, there appears exactly the V tilde Hermitian two by two matrix. And here there appears in something similar where the spatial components have the opposite sign, but that is not important for us right now. And so if we want to single out that here, then we can take, for example, P left times uh, V slash times P right, and then we just isolate exactly that V tilde. Okay. And so we can uh, isolate this Hermitian two by two matrix, which is equivalent to our four vector V mu. And then we can study the Lorentz transformation properties of that. And we can do it in two ways. On the one hand, P left V tilde, uh, P left V slash P right has the following Lorentz transformation. And now we study how it Lorentz transforms if we say the V mu is an ordinary four vector. Then it transforms according to the Lorentz four vector representation of the V mu. And let us uh, write down the result. So here we use 
the four vector transformation, then this of course simply gives p left times v slash prime, where v slash prime is the slashed uh, four vector of the Lorentz transformed vector. So this would be gamma mu times, let's call it lambda v mu p, right? Okay, so lambda v is the Lorentz transformed four vector v prime with overall open Lorentz index mu contracted with gamma mu gives this v prime slash. And that is what we obtain by doing a four vector Lorentz transformation in the normal way. The second Lorentz transformation that we now propose is exactly this one half comma one half Lorentz representation, which means that we have a, a product space. The product space is a matrix with two indices and the product representation means that each Lorentz index of that matrix is Lorentz transformed in the appropriate way. And here that means that we do this S von Lambda Spinor Lorentz transformation from the left and S to the minus one of Lambda Lorentz transformation on the right. That would be this one half comma one half transformation rule. Okay, and now let's do a few small steps. First step is what happens with this p left, p right, and the Lorentz transformation, that is what we discussed yesterday. Um, the Lorentz transformations commute with p left because this contains a product of two gamma matrices, each of them empty commutes with gamma five, so the whole thing commutes with gamma five and therefore also with this projector. So we can pull them inside. Let me drop the arguments. Then we have P left times S, V slash S to the minus one P right. And then we have here in the middle this combination S, V slash S to the minus one. And that is something we know something about because we have proven or we indicated the proof that this is a four vector and that means that if you put here in between uh, some s and s to the minus one then it transforms like a four vector. This is really a statement about gamma matrices and therefore the result of this combination here is now the following. Literally copied from what we had a few lessons ago. This is lambda to the minus one times gamma with overall open Lorentz index mu. And then uh, the number valued vector is of course unchanged here in this combination where we have matrix products, P right. So these matrices S and S to the minus one, they only do something with the four by four gamma matrices. And they make out of gamma mu here, the inverse Lorentz transformed gamma mu. Okay, now we compare this and that, and that is the same because here we have a scalar product of two four vectors. Here we also have a scalar product of two four vectors. A scalar product of two four vectors is invariant if you multiply both four vectors with a Lorentz transformation matrix. So this is the same as if I multiply both here with lambda. If I multiply both with lambda, then the lambda to the minus one drops out and here I get lambda. That is the same as what we have here. So let me just write it down. P left, gamma mu, lambda v mu, P right. That is the same. That is the point. And so the two transformations are equal or compatible. And that proves to you that the four vector transformation is identical to this one half comma one half representation. Okay. Any questions to this? So, 
It means that in our general classification of the Lorentz transformations, this uh, third simplest one, one half comma one half, is uh, a fancy name for the familiar four vector Lorentz transformation. And you can equivalently go back between, go back and forth between four vectors and these Hermitian two by two matrices. And actually, in some calculations, that is really useful. It's really done in practical calculations that instead of four vector calculations, you calculate everything in terms of those equivalent two by two matrices. In that way, some calculations become simpler and the results can be expressed in nicer forms. And um, so uh, just is making use of that equivalence. Okay, no questions. Then we move on to the real physics of the spin one case. And so let us now start slowly with some preliminary thoughts. Let us come up with some preliminary thoughts, which are not so preliminary anymore, because basically everything I will say now, we have said already possibly multiple times, um, because we had all these, um, let's say, indications of what would, might happen in the spin one case. And so this is all I want to write down now. So the first uh, thought is about degrees of freedom. Let us think about the degrees of freedom and uh, first we now want to study spin, uh, so one half comma one half representations. In other words, we want to study four vectors and four vector fields. So we will have fields like A mu of x. A mu is a four component quantity. So it has four components. And uh, therefore, on the level of fields, we have here four degrees of freedom. On the other hand, our Lorentz and Poincaré group investigation representation theory told us that if we have a spin one particle with a mass non-zero, then it has spin one. That means how many degrees of freedom? It is three degrees of freedom, namely, uh, in addition to, for each momentum, you have a spin degree of freedom, which can take three values. For example, spin z can take the values plus, minus one, and zero. So you have three degrees of freedom. On the other hand, spin one and mass zero, like for the photon, there we have only two degrees of freedom. Namely, uh, there is no such thing as a continuous or, um, let's say, spin with arbitrary orientation. There is only helicity, uh, the spin in forward or backward orientation, and the helicity can only take the value plus minus one, but not zero. And the helicity is actually Lorentz invariant unless you do a space reflection. And so there are only two degrees of freedom. And so there is this mismatch, which is now explicit, and this is now important. And so what does that mean? It means many things which we can already understand. First of all, on our level of fields, we have too many degrees of freedom. And uh, with our experience, it is now easy to guess that that will mean that on the Lagrangian description, we need constraints. We need constraints in order to eliminate some unphysical degrees of freedom, which we have here, but we do not need there. And so far, we have only met this second class constraints, which are the simpler kinds of constraints where we have auxiliary fields, which can be eliminated in a simple way. But here, we might also need gauge invariance. which is this first class constraints. Why? Because, I mean, you see it gets worse and worse, and the worse it gets, the more complicated the constraints might be. Let's write this down. Obviously, the m equals zero case is likely to be more complicated. That is why we start with a massive case. 
But clearly in the massless case, we need to eliminate more degrees of freedom. That is the case where we will need gauge invariance and that is more complicated. We will study it later. Good. If we are in the massive case, then we have three degrees of freedom. In the massless case, we have two degrees of freedom. Often you study limits in physics. So here you might want to think about the limit where the mass goes to zero. Also experimentally you think about it, uh, how well do we know that the mass of the photon actually is exactly mathematically zero. Experimentally we do not know whether the mass is zero or just extremely tiny so that we cannot experimentally observe it. But here there is a discrete difference between the massive and massless case. So it's for sure interesting to study how the theory here behaves if we take the massless limit. Something discrete or something uh, non-continuous might have to go on. Um, unless something specific happens with this third degree of freedom, namely uh, what could happen is that this third degree of freedom which becomes unphysical here, has interactions which slowly, continuously go to zero if you take the massless limit. If that happens, that this uh, third degree of freedom has vanishing interactions, then there might be a smooth limit and a limit which can be, uh, let's say, experimentally uh, not resolved. So let's write that down. The limit mass going to zero may be difficult. And so in particular, we get this idea that there is possibly a physical uh, phenomenon happening. Namely, if the limit should be continuous, then this uh, third degree of freedom should have vanishing interactions in the massless limit. But now remember a massless limit uh, when you take a dimension full quantity to zero you should always compare it to other dimension full quantities, otherwise your limit uh, makes physically no sense. So what is the dimensionless uh, quantity that goes to zero here? If you take the massless limit, you need to f uh, fix your energy or your momenta in your problem. And while keeping them fixed, the mass should go to zero. That is the physical limit. And so we can also say it like this, that momenta P mu kept fixed divided by m go to infinity. In that limit, uh, if the third degree of freedom vanishes or has vanishing interactions for that case, then maybe there is a continuous limit between the two cases. But that limit now is equivalent to something else. You do not need to take the massless limit in order to make that ratio infinite. You can just as well keep the mass fixed but look at infinite energies and momenta. So that means something about generally massive spin one theories. If they have this smooth limit to the massless case, then you should be able to keep the mass fixed but look at infinitely or very, very large energies and momenta and in those limits also the third degree of freedom should have very specific interactions. Otherwise the theory becomes inconsistent or leads to, for example, probabilities which uh, become infinite and therefore um, are inconsistent with quantum mechanical requirements. So that implies that we expect here somehow restricted interactions. So consistent massive spin one theories, which should be consistent for arbitrarily high energies they cannot have random interactions of the spin one particle, but the interactions should have very specific properties in order to allow that limit.
Which interactions could that be? For example, the interactions of the standard model where those spin one particles interact with a Higgs boson in very specific ways, which guarantees exactly that such a limit makes sense. So then, similarly, if you first have a massless theory and then you will think about going to the massive case, so you think about generating M non-zero from the massless case, that is for sure also difficult. Because if you only have a massless uh, theory, then you need an additional degree of freedom which is not there in your theory. So creating a mass from a zero mass is also not easy. And uh, so here, for example, the Higgs mechanism provides a solution. Okay, so we see here all these indications for very interesting physics appearing. Next point. <coughs> Apart from the degrees of freedom, we can also think about something else, namely about the norm of quantum states in our Hilbert space of states. We have already seen in the case of fermion versus boson that the norm is sometimes critical and uh, the commutational relations sometimes would predict that some states have negative norm, which is bad. Let us look at the following thing. Some generic expectation value of a product of two vector field operators. So what do we expect? what the result could be. If we have a Lorentz covariant theory, so let's assume that the result is compatible with Lorentz invariance, then the outcome of such a calculation, whatever the details might be, should be something Lorentz covariant with two indices mu nu. What is an object that could appear here? For example, the metric tensor. What is the problem with the metric tensor? The metric tensor has positive and negative entries automatically. So therefore, if you want to have a covariant result for this, you might inevitably run into the situation that some uh, terms here for some indices are negative and some others are positive. And you will not be able to arrange that all of them are simultaneously positive because that would contradict here the metric tensor. And so if, if that is maybe uh, the vacuum here and here some field operators, then that could correspond to the norm of some physical state. And then you see that you cannot arrange that all states in your space of states have positive norm, unless you break the Lorentz covariance. That is not very promising. So we expect here states with positive and negative norm. And so there are two issues now. The thing with the norm, which sounds really bad and discouraging. So Lorentz covariance seems to contradict positivity of the Hilbert space. On the other hand, we have this problem here with eliminating degrees of freedom. And one hope can be that the two problems cancel each other out. Because, for instance, it might be, and that will be the case, that, of course, exactly those uh, unphysical degrees of freedom which we must eliminate by using constraints, those are the ones which lead to negative norm, whereas the physical degrees of freedom which describe then really the physical particle states, they are the ones with positive norm. And so remember, the metric tensor has uh, one entry with one sign and three entries with the other sign. And so uh, the majority uh, should be um, the sign with the physical states and then there will be some unphysical uh, remainder. Okay, so that is what we can immediately see. Let me make you aware of one more very simple detail.
Okay, a very simple idea which you should already keep in mind is the following. Let's say the space of all four vectors V mu, very simply put. This space is of course a four-dimensional space. And how can we restrict the space? One very simple idea is to consider the following subspace of all four vectors which uh, have the following property. You fix one momentum, let's say P mu, and then you consider the subspace of all four vectors which are orthogonal in four dimensions to this uh, fixed external momentum four vector. So that space of all those vectors here is still a vector space, but it's a three-dimensional vector space. So this is one way how you can um, restrict your space, and that is a Lorentz covariant way. So if you do a Lorentz transformation of your P mu and your Lorentz transformation of all the Vs, then the condition remains. So if you satisfy the condition before the Lorentz transformation, then it's also satisfied after the Lorentz transformation. So this would be a Lorentz covariant way to go from a four-dimensional space to a three-dimensional subspace. So that is one thing that is good to know. And uh, from here it's not easy to see how you could go also to a two-dimensional subspace. So we will think about that later on, but at some point, of course, we will need to go from a four-dimensional space to a two-dimensional subspace, still in a Lorentz invariant way or covariant way. That is not obvious, but uh, this is obvious, and so let's keep that in mind. Any questions? Just then we can really begin with our discussion. Now we follow the usual blueprint that we have uh, already used for the scalar field and then for the spin one half field. Namely, we begin with a classical setup. And afterwards, we carry out canonical quantization and we do it for uh, the spin one and massive case. So however, in this case, I cannot begin with writing down the correct Lagrangian because we have to think a little bit in order to obtain the correct form of the Lagrangian. First, uh, we have here our building block is a real four vector field. I call it A mu of x, which has the following Lorentz transformation. Uh, under Lorentz transformation, the field A mu goes into a new field A prime mu, which has the following uh, value a prime mu at lambda x is equal to lambda b nu times a nu at x. So similar to the spinor field, we have this external additional Lorentz transformation. This time the obvious one just with lambda mu nu. In the spinor field, we had here at this point the s of lambda the spinor representation of the Lorentz transformations. And here we have just the ordinary lambda mu nu itself. So that is a four vector field. And now uh, we are searching for the correct Lagrangian. Let us first write down a general ansatz, general Lorentz invariant kinetic Lagrangian only, L kinetic with derivative operators with linear equation of motion. So the Lagrangian should be bilinear in the field and it should contain first derivatives of the field and it should be Lorentz invariant. So what can we have? We can have several terms. Uh, 10 seconds of time. Please think about some possible terms that we could write down.
So any ideas? What could we write down? What is Lorentz invariant and contains a few field operators and derivatives? Maybe on the left. Somebody, some idea. Okay, some coefficient a times what could we have? Yeah, for you. I mean, d mu a mu and d mu a mu. D mu a what? Mu. Okay. And then d mu mu a mu. Okay, let's call that times c. Good. Then what else? Now on the left. Is that Lorentz invariant? Yes, it obviously is. And now you should get some ideas what else could be Lorentz invariant instead of that, because that's not unique. So some idea. Yep. You could just use the product. Ah, but I only want kinetic terms right now, so all terms should have some derivatives. But uh, do you have some other ideas? Isn't that the divergence term d mu a mu? But not covariant. Ah, okay, but that uh, does not give a linear equation of motion. It's, this is linear in the field operator, so we don't want that. So it must be bilinear in the field operator. Yeah? Maybe a rotation term? How would that look like? Um, With three dimensional derivatives. Three-dimensional is not good. So, uh, but the basic idea that you can have is that we can distribute all the Lorentz indices in different ways. So the basic point is we need two fields with some indices and two derivatives with some indices. That's it. Two derivatives and two fields. C, A, D, A. And that is not the only way to distribute the Lorentz indices in a way such that all indices are contracted. So now invent some other way. Yeah. And Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. And then this. Exactly. Anything else? No, that's it. These are the three possibilities. There is not more and not less. So here, d mu in this way, so that you get something Lorentz invariant already here. Then that combination and this combination. That's all we can have. This is the completely general uh, kinetic term, and let's call that A, and that call, let's call that B. Why did I call the first line C? Because that is actually not needed. The first line is not needed because uh, the first line you can do partial integration. If you do partial integration, we know that we really only need the action, which is the full integral over x of the Lagrangian density, and so we can do partial integration. And if we do partial integration, we can put that derivative onto the other field, and this derivative onto the first field. And so the C term is actually equal to C up to total, um, total derivatives, d nu a mu times d mu a nu. And this is then the same as one of the other terms. Namely, it's the same as the b term. So that simply means b goes to b plus c. And then we can drop the c term and only take the a and b term. Or we could drop uh, a or b 
uh, you know, we cannot draw pay, but we could draw P instead. But anyway, uh, we have two independent terms and not three. Now, that is our most general kinetic term, and what is the best choice for us? What is the best choice? We want constraints. Therefore, let us search for constraints. What are constraints? In order to get constraints, we need the canonical momenta pi. Let's define pi nu is the derivative of this kinetic Lagrangian with respect to a nu dot. So I, I have now dropped the C term, okay, and there is only A and B. And let us now uh, derive the canonical momentum pi nu. It's the derivative of this Lagrangian with respect to A nu dot. Where is A nu dot? Here there is A nu dot. If mu is zero, if mu is zero, then also that mu is zero. Then the, the derivative of this line with respect to A nu dot is just another a nu dot uh, times 2a because of the derivative 2a times a nu dot. Okay. So here this contains a nu dot squared. Then here there is also a nu dot, a nu dot for mu equals zero, we have here a nu dot. And then on, on the other factor gives us um, d nu of a zero, also times two, so plus 2b times a uh, zero d nu, d nu of a zero. Can you read that? d nu of a zero. So that is our canonical momentum, pi nu. And so we want constraints. So if in general there are no constraints, in general we get some uh, relationship between pi and all the canonical variables in particular, we get some relationship to the time derivatives of the variables, and if we have that, then there is no constraint. That is the normal situation. But in some special cases, uh, there are constraints. In other words, the time derivatives here drop out. Under which conditions do the time derivatives drop out? I see two conditions which are possible. One is simple, another one is Less simple. Who sees one of the two possibilities how the time derivatives could drop out? Yeah. A is minus B. A is minus B. And uh, which uh, time derivative drops out in that case? All of them? Uh, no, only the zero point. Right. Okay, let's write it down. A, uh, so constraints. So if A is equal to minus B, then uh, the canonical momentum for the zero component, that just vanishes. That is in that case just zero, because then we have here nu is zero, we have here uh, A dot nu, uh, A dot zero, and here also uh, a zero dot, and a is equal to minus b, therefore the two cancel, and so this canonical momentum pi zero vanishes. That is one constraint. However, all the other canonical momenta for new non-zero, they do not drop out, then you would have here, for example, uh, di a zero, and here a dot i. That doesn't vanish, and the time derivative appears, so we have one constraint and the other pies, they are unconstrained. That sounds good. One constraint. That is very promising since we remember we must go from four to three degrees of freedom. There is a second possibility, namely A equals zero overall. If A is zero, then all of the time derivatives vanish and then all of our canonical momenta are constrained. And then we have too many constraints. So that means we have now made our choice and clarified which choice we should make for our Lagrangian. Namely, we should choose the one 
where we get one constraint, and that is the one where A is equal to minus B. And that leads us to an ansatz, fix A equal minus B. And then our ansatz is the following. Now the full Lagrangian uh, is the following. So let us first define the quantity F mu nu, D mu A nu minus D nu A mu. And then we define our Lagrangian minus 1 over 4 F mu nu F mu nu plus m square over 2 a mu a nu. So that is the familiar Lagrangian you know from electrodynamics. Uh, but here it's applied for a massive field and it contains this uh, field strength tensor combination. And uh, if you evaluate that, then you see that it fits the general formula with A equal to minus B, namely what is A and what is B in that case. So we get here, uh, you see, um, we get that term times itself, this term times itself, this gives such an A term, where the Lorentz indices of the derivatives match this squared and that squared, that gives A. So we get overall A is equal to minus one half. And then there are the cross term, this times that, that times this. This corresponds to our B term. They have a minus sign and therefore we get B is equal to plus one half. So this exactly corresponds to our general case with A equal to minus B. And it's normalized to one half, which is the perfect normalization because then if we take derivatives, then the one halves cancel and we get always unit coefficients, which is nice. So that explains the kinetic term here. And uh, in addition, I have now uh, added a mass term. And this mass term is modeled like in our Klein-Gordon case. It's the only possible Lorentz invariant term without derivatives and with, which is bilinear in the field. And remember again, our metric is such that uh, we have mostly minuses in the metric. So the majority of these terms here has actually minus m square over two. And one of the terms has plus m square over two. So the majority of these terms here has the same sign of the mass term as in the scalar field Klein-Gordon case with minus. And one of the terms has a unusual sign. Good, that defines our theory. And now let's uh, apply our Pavlov's reflex and just go through all the steps in the usual way. So first Euler-Lagrange equation. What is the Euler-Lagrange equation? We take our derivative of L with respect to um, the derivatives of the field, that gives us the same as this canonical momentum here. And then we obtain an equation, zero is equal to d mu f mu nu um, plus m square a nu. Okay. It is the same calculation that you do in classical electrodynamics. And this equation here between uh, the field strength tensor and the mass term, this is called the Broca equation. So it's similar to Maxwell's equations, except that we have this additional mass term. So then, we can now derive a few corollaries of this Broca equation, which are very important and useful. The first corollary is obtained by taking the d, um, what is it, the d nu derivative of this equation. If we apply the d nu derivative of the entire equation, what do we get? From here, we get d nu, d mu, f mu nu. So we have a symmetric second derivative applied onto the anti-symmetric field strength tensor and symmetric times anti-symmetric vanishes. Therefore, this first term automatically vanishes if we apply this d mu onto that equation. So we get zero on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side that gives zero. 
and then we apply the derivative onto the second term. The m square is non-zero, m square is non-zero, therefore it can cancel, and we simply get d nu a nu is equal to zero. So uh, if our Broca field satisfies the Broca equation, it automatically uh, satisfies also this simple equation, which is similar to a gauge fixing condition in electrodynamics. But here it's not a gauge fixing condition, it is the outcome of the equation of motion. Another corollary, if we now put back our derived uh, condition here into the Broca equation, then we can simplify the Broca equation. Namely, this equation, if you evaluate it, d mu acting on the field strength tensor gives two terms. What are the two terms? d mu literally uh, apply d mu onto that. Then the first term d mu d mu is the d'Alembert operator acting on a nu. The second term d mu acting on this gives d nu times d mu a mu. d mu a mu appears. That is this combination. That means the second term here vanishes automatically. So therefore what remains is only the first term which was d'Alembert acting on a nu. So a second corollary therefore is d'Alembert plus m square applied onto a nu is zero. That is the Klein-Gordon equation. So that is not equivalent to the Broca equation, it's a corollary, right? It follows if the Broca equation is satisfied, then as a result that is satisfied and this is satisfied as well. So it's the Klein-Gordon equation for every index mu. So we have basically three equations of motion which we can use. The next step is our conjugate canonical momentum. So we have already done some work. We know what it is. So pi nu is uh, now the general formula for a equal minus one half and b equal plus one half. Um, and it is then uh, a, uh, minus a nu dot plus d nu a zero. And that can be written in terms of the field strength tensor. So it's the field strength tensor f nu zero. So pi nu is the field strength tensor f nu zero. And one aspect of that is that the zero component identically vanishes because the field strength tensor is totally anti-symmetric and so the zero zero component simply vanishes in line with what we have said already at the beginning. So therefore we have one constraint. Okay, so a constraint. Then uh, we have defined our canonical momenta. Let us look at the equation of motion uh, for the canonical momenta. So let us put this into the Broca equation for nu equal zero. If you look at the Broca equation for nu equal zero, you get d mu f mu zero is equal to something d mu f mu zero is the derivative of the canonical momentum. f mu zero is the canonical momentum. So for nu equals zero, this becomes an equation. d mu of pi mu plus m square a zero is equal to zero. Okay. So and that tells you now uh, that the derivative of uh, pi um, uh, pi zero vanishes, pi zero vanishes, and so that uh, reduces to space derivatives of the uh, remaining pi i, spatial pi's, 
And so then we have here an equation of motion which contains no time derivative. An equation that contains no time derivative is again a constraint. A constraint between the variable a0 and the pi i canonical momentum. So we have a second constraint. And now you can ask yourself, are these two constraints first class or second class? We are second class uh, means that the Poisson bracket between the constraints does not vanish. And so here, pi zero, that is one constraint, and the other constraint involves a zero. Therefore, the Poisson bracket between the two does not vanish. And so that means we have second class constraints, which is the simpler kind of constraints. It's the simpler kind of constraints where we can often simply eliminate uh, these fields by their equation of motion and plug in the solution into all our equations and then forget about uh, the fields entirely. So we can regard this A0 as an auxiliary field. And it could be eliminated by its equation of motion, which can be solved without time derivatives. A0 is minus 1 over m square times d mu pi mu, or equivalently minus 1 over m square times di pi i, because pi 0 doesn't even exist. Okay, so far, then let us uh, follow our blueprint further. The next step is the Hamiltonian and the Legendre transformation. So we define a Hamiltonian density by Legendre transforming our Lagrangian density. And for the Legendre transformation, we simply apply this recipe that we know our A0 is not really a dynamical variable. It's an auxiliary field. It should be treated as an abbreviation of something else. And uh, therefore, we ignore it in the Legendre transformation. So we simply write pi i, the non-zero canonical momenta, times a zero i, sorry, uh, a i dot, a i dot minus l. And then, of course, we, uh, in the Legendre transformation, we use pi i is equal to what it must be, namely pi i is equal to f i zero is equal to d i a zero minus d zero a i. But also here, we then replace our a zero by the solution to its equation of motion. Okay, and then here, for example, we get pi i times a i dot. a i dot, what is a i dot? a i dot is equal to uh, minus pi i plus something else. Okay, so this will become minus pi i plus something else. So we get pi i square, the square of the momentum, uh, plus some other terms. And in the Lagrangian, we also have this f mu nu. f mu nu contains in part f i zero square, so this f mu nu term here also contains pi i squared, plus some other terms. And so I don't know, do you want me to show you the full calculation? I will first write down the result. The result is in the end minus one half pi i times pi i plus um, 1 over 2 m square times the following, namely di pi i times dj pi j, so such a divergence of pi squared, which comes, for example, from eliminating the a0 by its equation of motion and plugging that into the rest of the terms. Then we get this, and 
plus 1 over 4 Fij Fij, so this is the remaining uh, field strength tensor term where we have already treated the zero components differently because they give rise to pi's. And then we have minus m square over 2 a mu a mu. Uh, sorry, a i. A i, of course, because the a zero square, the a zero square, gives rise to terms like this. The a zero square contributes to that term, uh, and some other terms contribute as well. And so, from that we get this. And here we only have the actually physical variables a i. So, and here you see something which is, of course, always the case, but here it's more prominent than before. The Hamiltonian is not Lorentz invariant. And so, therefore, time is treated specially. But here it's particularly obvious. So, you see really the three components appearing everywhere, and the zero components has been treated in a very, very special and different way from all the rest. And so, of course, this is not a Lorentz invariant quantity. And it shouldn't be, because the Hamiltonian is never a Lorentz invariant quantity. But here it's particularly non Lorentz invariant. And so it's already kind of uh, disturbing that we need to say uh, the AIs, they are physical uh, variables in the canonical formalism, whereas the A0 is just an auxiliary field and an abbreviation for something else. So already that is, of course, something non Lorentz covariant. So the derivation is obvious. You just plug in everything and work for a while. Not a long while, but a little while. And, uh, but let's just interpret the terms, maybe. Uh, pi i is the zero component of the field strength tensor. If you remember electrodynamics, we are not doing electrodynamics because we have a massive field, but let's apply the electrodynamics interpretation. What is the meaning of that, the physical meaning of this here? Yep. The electric, field. the electric field. So this here is really one half vector E squared. What is that Fij? The spatial components of the field strength tensor is then therefore obviously the magnetic field. The magnetic field. And so here with all the prefactors, this is exactly one half times vector B squared. And so the sum of the two, E squared plus B squared times one half, you might remember in electrodynamics, this is uh, the um, energy density stored in the electromagnetic field. And here we have some additional terms. That comes from the mass term, obviously. This in part also reflects the Lorentz invariant mass term. And it has no um, interpretation for electrodynamics. Let me only say here, by partial integration, we could write this also as minus 1 over 2 m square pi i di dj pi j. And so sometimes that is useful to know when you evaluate the derivatives with respect to pi's. Then you see here 1 pi explicitly and uh, its coefficient is then easier to read off. So then we have the Hamiltonian, we have canonical momenta, we have identified physical variables, namely the AI. And the last classical thing is the Poisson brackets. And here we need to say what our dynamical variables are once again. The dynamical variables are a i and pi i, and not the zero components. And a zero is an abbreviation uh, that I wrote down before. And then our Poisson brackets are only defined for these uh, fields, namely a i with x and t and a j, y and t. Poisson bracket that is zero. 
AI with the same argument and pi j with the same argument. That is equal to a delta function, three-dimensional delta function of x minus y. But we also have two indices, i, j, and they give here the metric tensor g, i, j. That actually implies a minus sign for us. If we would do it with a lower index, then we would have here a Kronecker delta, i, j. And finally, pi with pi. is zero again. And then we do not show it, but you could uh, show that with these Poisson brackets, you reproduce the Lagrangian equation of motion. That is the whole point of the Hamiltonian formalism. After going through this procedure and eliminating the auxiliary field in that particular way, you should now check that uh, applying the Poisson bracket with the Hamiltonian, this Hamiltonian, these Poisson brackets, that gives you a time dependence a dot equal Poisson bracket of a with Hamiltonian, reproduces the Broca equation. If that is the case, then we have done uh, correctly the transition to the Hamiltonian formalism. That is the decisive point. And here I told you in the very beginning of the semester, if you have constraints, it is not so easy to go from Lagrangian to Hamiltonian formalism. We have done it for one exercise where we did exactly the same thing. There we had some unphysical variable which was called QB. And that QB variable could be treated in exactly the same way as we are now treating the A0 field. And uh, we showed there that the Hamiltonian and Lagrangian formalism give rise to equivalent equations of motion. And here we just assume without extra proof that the same result is true here. And I also gave you a reference. This uh, general statement here is explicitly proven in the textbook by Weinberg. And so we rely on this here. So that is known to give the same result as the Lagrangian formalism. And therefore, we have uh, treated the theory on the classical level entirely. far so good. Everything in principle according to the general recipe in spite of the difficulties, but the general recipe still contains this uh, procedure also here. And so let us now come to the canonical quantization. Of this system. Which is supposed to give us a quantum theory uh, with a well defined Hilbert space, well defined operators, and a certain interesting interpretation. And the quantum field theory should, like in the previous cases, be a relativistic quantum field theory with a unitary representation of the Poincare group. So we postulate that there are now operators A hat i, pi hat j. The operator A0 is just introduced as an abbreviation for this 1 over minus 1 over m square di pi i hat, like at a classical level. And the Hamiltonian is the d3x integral over the Hamiltonian density, where we plug in the operators A hat and pi hat. Then we postulate commutation relations, which are modeled after the Poisson brackets, namely AI, uh, with the same arguments. Let's, let me not write always the arguments. They are always the same. That is 0. Then AI pi j. That is this times i i times g i j times three-dimensional delta function of x minus y and pi with pi is zero again. And here again the spatial components are distinguished and treated specially would be an exercise 
a question to ask, what is the commutator of a i and a zero? That looks like it could be non-zero because a zero contains the pi's, so therefore it might not commute with a i. So we have quite non-trivial commutation relations here, but that is our starting point. And let us now look at the Heisenberg equation of motion. That should be satisfied by our field operator. And so the Heisenberg equation of motion, a i dot, a i dot, should be equal to i times the commutator of the Hamiltonian times a i. a i dot. So like always. And let us try to evaluate what that commutator should be. What it is, in other words. What is it? So where is our Hamiltonian? It's at the top. You have to imagine hats over all the symbols. So this is literally our quantum operator. And then where do we get a non-zero commutator of that expression? with AI. Maybe we can pull it down. Okay, then we have here many terms. And we have here pi square. That for sure gives a commutator with A, which is non-zero. Here we also have pi square. That also gives something non-zero. How about that? Does that give a non-zero commutator with a i? Why not? Can you explain? Because there are just fields a, a with a. Yes, they are, there are spatial derivatives of a, spatial derivatives of a, but spatial derivatives are not related to canonical momenta. Spatial derivatives can be just pulled out of the commutators. And so for that reason, this is like the commutator of A with A and gives zero. And therefore, this, of course, also gives zero in the commutator. And so we have two terms which we need to um, evaluate. And so this term is simple. So let's start with that term, uh, I. So from here, we have a minus sign. Then we have the commutator of pi square with A gives minus i, minus i times minus 1 gives plus i, plus, plus i, i times i gives minus 1, so in the end we get minus pi, minus pi from the commutator, minus pi hat i. Then from here, and here it's easier to look at the red version, so look at the red version, anyway you know that the commutator with a square gives two times the factor times uh, the commutator with the other factor. That is clear. But let's uh, do it with the lower version. Then the commutator gives two times the commutator of a with this pi times the remaining factor. That is simpler to see. So the remaining factor contains then two derivatives acting on pi times minus 1 over 2m square. And from the commutator of pi with a, we get minus i times plus i gives plus 1 times minus gives overall minus 1 over m square, minus 1 over m square times di dj pi j. di dj pi j with an open index i. That's it. That's it. And what is that actually? What is that actually? We can simplify it a little bit by uh, writing this dj pi j by using our auxiliary field a0. Minus 1 over m squared di pi i minus 1 over m square dj pi j, that is a0. So here this is just di acting on a0. So we could simplify it by saying minus pi i plus di a0. 
the operator. Then what is the equation of motion for pi? Pi i is i times the commutator of h with pi i. And here it uh, might be a little bit simpler, but not completely simple. We now uh, can ignore those terms here, but we need to do the commutator of f i j with pi i. And then the commutator here, that will be easy. What happens with this commutator of f i j square with pi i? So you need to imagine that uh, this term would be the same as one half. So you just do d i a j times f i j. So in one of the two terms you can ignore the anti-symmetrization and just take one term times the other f i j times one half instead of one quarter. That is a simplification and then you can also do partial integration and write it as minus a i a j times d i f i j up to partial integration, that would be the same. And so then the commutator becomes much easier to see. Then you, we know that uh, we have a square term, so the commutator is the same as just taking the commutator with aj, the two cancels, and then we get the commutator of aj with pi i. That gives just i times uh, gij times the remaining factor. So let's write it down. That just gives dj f j i operator. And then from here, uh, this commutator gives uh, the two cancels, and from a with pi we get i. i square gives minus one, that cancels this minus here, so we get plus m square times a i. Okay, what happens if you combine the two equations? We have now two equations. A dot is equal to something with pi. Pi dot is equal to something with A. What happens if we uh, take another time derivative of the first equation? Then we get on the right hand side pi dot. We could plug in pi dot from here. And then we get something d0 acting on that. Uh, give something with dj fji. And then we get the original Broca equation. So the two equations reproduce the original Broca equation. d mu f mu nu for the entire operator plus m square a new operator is equal to zero. So that is valid. And so let me just write that in the corner. This of course uh, not such a surprise because in all cases so far our Heisenberg equation of motion has reproduced the classical equation of motion. But it's less and less obvious the more constraints we have. Because we really go more and more away from our original field variables but in the end it boils down such that the original equation is satisfied. So let's write it down. We have the following equations. d mu f hat mu nu plus m square a nu is zero. And uh, we have already shown that that leads to d mu a hat mu is equal to zero. That is a corollary and it remains a corollary also in the quantized case. And then we also obtain the Klein-Gordon equation box plus m square a hat nu is equal to zero. So our field operator satisfies all these equations. And let me also add here in this box, pi i hat is equal to f i zero, which is the same as d i a hat zero minus 
T0 AI hat. And A0 hat is an abbreviation, I just copied from before, of di pi i. All of these equations are now valid in our canonically quantized theory. And so this is basically the set of equations that we must fulfill at the end. And so this is the set of uh, operator equations which define our theory and uh, the next task is to solve the canonical quantization which means that we need to construct actually operators and a Hilbert space of states on which the operators are defined such that all those equations are valid. So let us just go on for a few more minutes to see what we need to do in the next lecture. So as always, we now need to solve the canonical quantization. And how are we going to do it? We have many equations that we need to satisfy. And one of them is an equation that we are already familiar with, the other ones are new. So the Klein-Gordon equation is the one which we are already familiar with and therefore let's start with it. And once we have satisfied it, we will need to look out for the other equations which need to be satisfied on top of that. But first, let us look at the most general solution of the Klein-Gordon equation. Box plus m square i hat nu equals zero for all nu. And our field operator is real, so a hat is equal to a dagger. So we have an Hermitian operator and so that is the same situation as in our first case with a real scalar field. So each component satisfies the same equation as the real scalar field. And there for the scalar field we had the most general solution of that equation and so if that was true then it should be applicable here as well. So each component must have the following form a mu of x is this dp tilde integral of e to the minus i p x and then we have some operator a sub p but now with an index mu plus e to the i p x with some operator a sub p mu dagger. Then we have the same a mu operator here with dagger and without dagger and therefore the whole thing is Hermitian. That condition is immediately satisfied. And the Klein-Gordon equation is satisfied by having here this Lorentz invariant measure which contains the delta function p square minus m square. So all the Fourier components have a p square equal to m square, so the Klein-Gordon equation is satisfied for each Fourier mode. And then we simply have for each Lorentz index mu, we have one operator a mu of p. So for each Lorentz index mu, we have copied our general solution for the scalar field. Therefore that must be correct. And this is now just a four component operator. Now, that's of course not enough. We need to satisfy the additional new element. Let's say it's a crucial, very important new element. What is the crucial new element? It is uh, the Broca equation, but that has in particular the consequence in the second line. It's like a gauge condition, d mu a mu equals zero. d mu a mu equal zero. So the operator must satisfy that additional equation. And this equation is an equation which correlates the four different Lorentz components. They are completely uncorrelated here, 
what via this equation the four components become correlated and not independent of each other. What does that equation imply at the level of the Fourier decomposition? If you hit that ansatz with d mu, what happens? You just pull the d mu inside the bracket and what happens in that case? Then from the derivative of the exponential function you pull down a factor of minus i p mu. And then you have here in the Fourier decomposition p mu times a mu. And the Fourier uh, uh, representation is zero if and only if every Fourier component is zero. Therefore uh, that is equivalent to saying that p mu times those operators a mu p equal to zero for all p. And here you see again that is a linear uh, equation between the four components. So some linear combination of these four operators must vanish. And you can express one of them in terms of the other three. So for example, a zero of p is not independent. And that of course is correlated to the fact that our a zero operator is uh, constrained or is constrained. So this is just a reflection. Our zero component is not independent and here we see that via this equation of motion uh, the zero component of that Fourier coefficient can be eliminated and can be replaced by a linear combination of all the other ones. And I think here we have to stop, right? Time is up. So here we have, this is a very good point to stop. We have this equation, four operators, so one out of them can be eliminated in terms of the other three. And what that implies is our discussion the next time. So thank you and see you on Thursday.